Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, or maybe even middle of the night if anyone's joining from Asia. Um, so before we begin, I just want to go through some housekeeping things for the meeting. Um, don't want to take too long, but one we're gonna we're gonna keep the chat open, um, but we ask that everybody um, stay on mute until the question and answering period. During that time, if you type a question into the chat. I will read it out to the group. If you prefer to ask the question yourself, please use the hand raising function, which is um, if you mouse on your screen on the bottom, there's um, a um, reactions uh, icon and you should be able to, to raise your hand using that. Um, the other thing we're gonna ask you to do is to rename yourself with your full name and your class year. Um, as you can see that I have it, um, Julie Schwedak, 85, PhD, because I didn't get my PhD at MIT, but whatever the appropriate way is for your name, if you mouse over yourself, there'll be three horizontal buttons in the upper right corner. If you click on that, you should see in the menu um, a rename function. So if you could just rename yourself with, with your full name and your class year. And then finally, I wanna remind people that uh, directly following this meeting, is the business meeting, which you need to register for separately and is for AMIDA members only. However, it's not too late to register for the business meeting. We're going to be going over um, everything we've accomplished for this year and um, a little bit on thoughts for next year. Uh, so please register for that. Um, we will be putting a link into the chat. It's not too late if you're already a member. If you're not a member, we'd be delighted to have you, but it is too late to join the business meeting because it takes about 24 hours for that to go through. All right, I'll remind you again at the end at the end of this talk. But um, without further ado, I would like to introduce Marjorie Resnick, our keynote speaker, who teaches uh, literature and women's and gender studies at MIT. Her fields of interest include Spanish history, international women's writing cultural constructs of globalization and the history of women in education, among many other things. Uh, she recently received the James A. and Ruth Leviton Teaching Award, which is a very prestigious teaching award in the School of Humanities, Arts and Sciences. Uh, she received her PhD from Harvard and was an assistant professor at Yale before she came to MIT in 1977 as the chair of far foreign languages and literature. She founded Women's Studies at MIT. She is an honorary MIT alum, an honorary member of AMIDA, and the director of the Margaret McVicker Women's Oral History Project. So I just mentioned a small smattering of things about Marjorie Resnick, because otherwise I'd take up the entire hour. So um, without further ado, I give you Marjorie. Thank you. Thank you so much for your warm welcome, and thank you for inviting me to today's gathering. I'm especially grateful to AMITA's leadership and for the support that AMITA members have given to our Women's Oral History Project. By your willingness to share your life stories and for the financial support that's made it possible for our wonderful Europe students to work on this endeavor. We now have more than 120 oral histories in the digital uh, archives at MIT and anyone can consult them, they're great. Before I start my talk, I wanted to share with you something because it involves you. Each year at graduation, I receive very warm notes from students who have worked on the project and have been in my classes, but I wanted to quote one from this year. As I hope I've told you before, interviewing with Amateur Oral History Project has been one of the most personal, meaningful things, personally meaningful things I've done at MIT. Being an interviewer has given me a heightened appreciation for my place at MIT and the work of women who paved the way. With MIT's current gender parity, it's easy for me to forget that a woman was such a rarity just a lifetime ago. Approaching graduation, I'm especially appreciating what an incredible experience it's been to talk with women such as Florence Hazeltine, Karen Aronson, and Virginia Norwood. It's been an honor to hear the thoughts and reflections of such interesting and bright women. Interviewing, me, interviewing has given me a more holistic view of my own career. Many women with careers I consider impactful and impressive also meandered and faced setbacks. 
I hope that at the end of this talk, which looks at the arc of women's education at MIT, we can think together of a way to bottle that sense of life that Kira, that student, found through interviews and distributed to our women students. Of course, this is a special year for all women at MIT, the 150th anniversary, Valenzuela Richards degree in 1873. Her work was obviously deeply connected to the society in which she lived, in which factories were polluting the environment, and her life was dedicated to examining the interaction between nature and the built environment, truly founding the field of environmental science, opening the women's lab, and of course, the lab at Anasquam. Amongst the early women, uh, Catherine Dexter McCormick's career was wholly shaped by politics and economics of the century in which she worked, fighting Freudian psychology, working as a suffragette to work to get the vote for women, and of course, the cause of birth control, supporting Margaret Sanger and the Worcester Foundation for the development of the birth control pill, building McCormick Hall to expand the number of women ad admitted to MIT. Yet today, I'm not gonna focus on the measurable impact MIT women have made on our lives. Instead, I'd like to open up a discussion based on history, social context, and economic realities that have brought us to the complex world today's undergraduate women face. And to think together with the massive intelligence experience and experience of those in this room, whether as women with historical perspective, we can both understand and possibly offer some wisdom as our students navigate an environment so different from that which we knew as undergraduates. I'm gonna focus not on how women shape the environment, but how current politics, economic and social change shape today's undergraduate climate. Of course, this is a personal perspective in the question and answer period. I look forward to others challenging and enriching my views. My talk is divided into three major periods, the 20s, the 1920s, these are based on the oral histories, the 1920s to World War II, World War II and its aftermath, and post 1960s. The oral histories of women who graduated from MIT in the 1920s underscored the freedom that came with the fact that they were total outsiders. This is not a silver lining hypothesis. Obviously, the exclusion of most women from scientific education was negative. However, being an MIT woman student was such a rarity that there was no articulated expectation for how they would use their education or what shape their lives would take. They engaged in restless searches for ways to use their intelligence despite often crushing social, political, personal, and academic hurdles. But those struggles were not predetermined by their parents, high school guidance counselors, professors, or economic concerns. All came from secure economic backgrounds. All were marginalized initially in their education at MIT and then often in their professional lives. They found themselves at the edges, yet none seems excessively worried about lives not lived according to a blueprint and somehow surprised to find that, as Adrian Rich says in her poem, uh, a life I didn't choose chose me. Martha Munzer, the class of 1921 said, quote, I often wonder what it is that makes you choose a certain path of life. Sometimes it's family, all were doctors and lawyers, or perhaps you had an inclination for a special field. Well, in my case, and please don't laugh, it was because I had a crush on my science teacher, Augustus Clark. And if he had taught Latin, I might have become an ancient language major, but he was a physics and chemistry teacher and felt I should become a scientist, so I did. She goes on, during the depression, women engineers couldn't get jobs. So she had taught uh, chemistry at the Ethical Cultural School in New York for 25 years. And she took kids to Scranton, Pennsylvania to a mine. And a friend said to me, Martha, if you have a bunch of kids in the country for seven weeks, you should do a group project in ecology. I said, what's that? I never had heard the same course in biology, either, either. I had simply done the hard sciences, physics and chemistry and knew nothing whatsoever about biology. I applied to the Conservation Foundation. I found them in the phone book to get help with this ecology project. And this miraculously changed the whole course of my life. Um, she resigned as a teacher in 1954 and joined the Conservation Foundation for the next 14 years where she published 
an incredible number of books on ecology, conservation for children, and also one called Engineers Don't Have to Be <laughs> Conservation Ecological Disasters. Um, then there's Bertha Dodge. She was taken by her husband to Guatemala, didn't know exactly how she could use her expertise, but noticed that potato farming was done in a very non-useful way, insofar as there was no fertilizer, there were all kinds of elements lacking in the way potato farming was done. And so she changed that because she happened to be in Guatemala, had to figure out how to use her education and completely changed the way potato farming, which is a staple in Guatemala, was done. Some early MIT pioneers did make calculated decisions, but those were their own. They did not come from others' intuition about how, she, how they should live. Marjorie Pierce in the class of 1922, who was an architect, uh, started working for a big architectural firm in Boston in those years, Charles T. Maine, and said, I could have stayed there the rest of my life, but in that office, I never would have got anywhere as a woman or as an architect. So I cut the umbilical cord and started out on my own. But there's never a note in any of these, not one note in any of these records of anything but their own initiatives. And sometimes a little suggestion by someone on the side of how their lives were shaped. That sense of freedom and serendipity suffuses the interviews through the 1940s. Leona Zarsky, who came to MIT in 1937, when there were only six women in her class, wanted to be a patent lawyer. She was sure she was going to be a patent lawyer, but she said she was going to be the first woman on the Supreme Court. But she X'd out of patent law with her first English paper, which she failed. So then she thought she'd go into public health, but she decided on medicine. She was very isolated. She lived at home. She was only 15 when she came to MIT. But she did get into a biology society at MIT, and she was the first woman on a freshman council. And she quotes, so that was the struggle at the Institute, to be my own person and to be a person and not to be overwhelmed with the coursework. So up through the 1940s, the women who dared to come and did MIT or came by accident did not have a pattern they were following, as far as I can tell. Maybe your readings of these will be different and everything's open to interpretation. So in the 40s, there was Emily Wick, Mary Frances Wagley, Virginia Norwood, Betsy Ann Lehman, and all still were so marginalized that there's no template that I think I or any other reader uh, could place over why they came to MIT, how their lives evolved, what it all meant. They were a diverse group. Then came World War II. World War II offered enormous potential for redefining social roles. Until the 1940s, there was a social stigma attached to a working wife. Now wives worked not because of academic or <laughs> because of economic need, but because of relative economic need. That is the desire to prove a stand, improve a standard of living for their families. During the war, there were great gains in female labor force. Over 6 million women, three quarters of whom were married, took jobs for the first time. But the potential of World War II for redefining gender roles was disappointing. And this I do have on a slide, just because there are so many, if, if you want to show it, you don't have to, but you can. Okay, so these, you know, when I look at World War II, and I don't, I've done whole talks on World War II and gender, but... Um, why didn't it work? Why didn't this big influx of women into the workplace change our lives? Well, they didn't. Because first of all, there was the myth of job equality for women. And for the most part, job segregation by sex persisted. And then there was the idiom that constructed women as delicate was marshaled to justify use of new technology as simplification. Well, that's pure baloney because the truth is, the United States zoomed in car and truck production during World War II because we were able to design systems that hadn't existed prior to the war to mechanize car and truck production. But at the end of the war, that was used as a justification, um, you know, that oh, we only did this because of women's physique and inability to perform men's jobs. Oh, that's ridiculous. Okay. Then, <laughs> women, when they were hired, 
we're told, well, you know, you're taking the place of a man and when the rightful owner of this job returns, you'll be gone. And the other was Labour's position on the issue. And this is very ironic. The AF, now the AFL-CIO, but the CIO's wartime struggles for equal pay for women workers narrowed the sex differentials in wages considerably, which made permanent female substitution less appealing to management. Finally, um, when women were needed, statement, these, this is very funny, uh, statements that reconciled the women's war work through analogies between women's work at home and the plants were used. And I love this. This is from Sperry Gyroscope. They're trying to recruit women. Note the similarity between squeezing orange juice and the operation of a small drill press, or anyone can peel potatoes. <laughs> Burying and filing are almost as easy. And these I took from pamphlets trying to recruit women. Probably the most noxious reality of women returning to the workplace was the resurgence of domesticity, both as a practice and an ideology. At the end of the war. And now I have my second slide, my only other, okay? At the end of the war, there were virulent attacks uh, focusing on mothers who worked. Uh, Sigmund Freud's theories were used to show that women who wanted to work, who wanted to do anything out of the home, had edible problems and wanted to be men. And even worse was John Bowlby, who was a British psychologist who framed the attachment theory. And in 1950, he wrote, and it was published for the World Health Organization, the quote I have there, that children need their mothers 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and that was absolutely necessary if a child was gonna have later positive relationships. That was very, very damaging. Okay, you can take that off now. Given the rhetoric surrounding women's new participation in the workplace, reversion to the pre-war patterns was seen to be the only real possibility. Um, but the exclusion from male jobs did not mean that women stopped working. What happened was they went into so-called pink professions. Women moved from the factory, factory to lower, much lower play, paying jobs, um, as clerical sales and service work. And those fields expanded enormously in the post-war decades. So the battlefield was the nursery and the weapon was psychological theory as sociologists and psychologists emphasized the relationship of mother's employment to child neglect. I don't know why people accepted this, but it seemed to be something, they seemed to be theories that were very easily accepted by most Americans, um, that women's transgression of domestic role was viewed as a neurosis, by Freud, and that it would have negative effects on their children were they not to be with them all the time. Now, how did women deal with this? Because by the 1950s, this cult of domesticity was very prevalent. So I chose one of the oral histories from the 1950s, which I chose it because um, this person was actually a nun. And when she graduated from high school at St. Joseph's Academy in 1950 in Minneapolis, Carol Tower entered the Sisters of St. Joseph's as a novitiate. Now I'm sure if I were to do a poll here, most people would vote and say that being a nun was probably antithetical to science and that turned out not to be the case at all. She says, 10% of the girls in my class became nuns. Why? Most Catholic girls, thought of having marriage and children. But if you wanted something more, you became a nun. There were more academic possibilities, more professional possibilities. There was a wonderful poet, Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, a Mexican poet of the 17th century. And she was both a feminist and a major writer. And she too became a nun in order to write, in order to have a career. So 17th century Mexico, 20th century uh, the United States shared some characteristics. Carol's order told her to do music in college because they needed a music teacher in the school, in the Catholic high school. And then the head of the order went and said to people, this is what we need, this is what you're gonna study. So she had no choice. 
A few years later, the head of the order came to her and said, we need math. And they sent her to get a master's in math at the University of Minnesota. She had never taken an undergraduate course in math. A few years later, the same head said, we need you as a college teacher. We don't have enough college teachers of math at St. Catharines. And they sent her to MIT she, for a PhD in math. Now she had never taken math as an undergraduate, had only gotten a master's in math to teach, but they gave her a tutor over the summer and she did extremely well at MIT. She had great mentorship and she says, well, maybe because uh, at that point we were still wearing habits. And so I was completely dressed in black. So people thought of me as totally asexual and no one bothered me. And my thesis advisor loved me. He sent her to Toronto. She did incredible research. You should read this. Later, she went back and taught math at the college level at St. Catharines. When the mother superior came and said, you know, we really need to teach philosophy. We don't have enough philosophy here. And sent her to Georgetown. She got a second PhD in ethics at Georgetown, which is a, the Kennedy School there. It's phenomenal. At the Kennedy Institute of Ethics. That changed her life. She left the order in 1970. She got a second PhD in philosophy. She did teach philosophy and bioethics at St. Catharines and at the University of Minnesota. But most importantly, she became a member of the NIH Human Embryo, Embryo Research Panel and the working group on pluripotential stem cell research. She had a major role for 17 years in the American Academy of Gynecology, defining the protocols for stem cell research, embryonic research, and end-of-life decisions. Um, still, there were so few women in the 1950s that there was plenty of room for invention. You didn't have to be a nun, but being a nun helped. And in fact, it made me recall that when I was in graduate school at Harvard in the late 60s, there were three nuns in my program. But not one oral history in the 1950s says, I came to MIT because it's what my parents wanted me to do. So the, now we enter the current part of the arc of women at MIT, which I think really started in 1963 with the opening of the West Wing of McCormick Hall and the publication of Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique that same year. The East Wing, for those of you who don't know, the East Wing opened in 1968. Women's liberation from the ideology of domesticity echoed in a surge of sentiment applauding the employment of women, whether married or single. Women were now more mindfully applying to MIT. By 1977, which is the first year I was at MIT, they constituted 15% of the undergraduate population. Integration of dorms began in 1980 and the numbers expanded. Between 1980 and today, cataclysmic changes in Americans' economic, social, and political life reverberated in higher education. There was affirmative action, <clears throat> Title IX, and a greater recognition of the importance of a diverse student body. This changed but probably not enough, elite universities like MIT. Barriers to women's admission at MIT actually disappeared sometime along that time frame as Art Smith addressed the disparity in SAT scores between women and men. But as society struggled to keep up with social change, so did undergraduate women. New anxieties emerged, ironically, the loosening of the strictures that had defined coeducation, the freedom from binary gender definitions, and the full entrance of women into the workforce made the serendipity that characterized all kinds of choices of the MIT women, early MIT women, almost impossible for undergraduates to imagine. College choice as a life-defining moment became the norm. Middle-class high school women and men, of course, for the most part, worked in a planned sequence of courses, activities, internships to enhance their access to college. They had a template for success honed from the time they entered high school. This was not true of those women from communities where whether because of income, education, or race, the building blocks of the perfect resume was still unknown. Um, and I wanna say here that my remarks are of course anecdotal and from my own experience, but because I speak Spanish and teach courses in Spanish and English, I have to say that 
our cohort and, and very involved with those two communities at MIT um, are not generally as um, clear when they come to college as what they want to be and how MIT is gonna get them to that goal. College became a stepping stone to a high paying career. There was nothing serendipitous about college choice by the, by the year 2000. Yet when they moved from carefully cultivated high school world to the world of MIT, where choices, social, political, sexual, or dizzying, life became for many tough. Parental pressure was now a factor for most students in terms of their choice of major. When I was head of house at McCormick, we'd have parents call us and say, I want you to be sure my daughter doesn't change from course six to course two. And in fact, we will stop, this actually happened, we will stop supporting her financially if she does so. That student happened to be president of the dorm at that time and disappeared for a year and a half until I found her working at Nordstrom's in LA. That's a long story, she came back. Um, parents also think they can control the social lives of their students. Some parents insist that students only date within a particular ethnicity. Other parents don't want their students to date at all. Um, parents still worry about MIT, which to which they send their children in order to get a diverse education, will somehow embrace diversity. Many women stay in the silo that brought them to the Institute. Some test the unknown waters, social and academic possibilities, but then just can't deal with the unknown and the unpredictable. A whole edifice of helpers was established to get them through. A new protective college teaching legislation emerged. We we're supposed to give trigger warnings and I'm assuming everybody knows what that is, but in case you don't, it means that if I'm teaching a book that has a seduction in it, and there might be a student who uh, suffered seduction or rape, worse still, I'm supposed to give a trigger warning, or if it has violence, but anyhow. Um, and then there's, we're, we were given language warnings. You know, we're supposed to use correct pronouns for students. There's mandatory online training that faculty have to do, um, dealing with sexual assault, sexual harassment. One would think that this is a good thing, except that, as I will say, show later, the real power to address sexual assault and sexual harassment and the offices that really are supposed to deal with that are, from my point of view and students' point of view, quite dysfunctional. One of the negative aspects of all this legislation and cajoling is that it engendered anger from faculty. In this May's faculty newsletter, letter, one of my colleagues in math wrote, this is a quote, President Reif espoused and championed the idea that faculty should be their students' surrogate parents. At times, his emails made one suspect that when not hobnobbing with the pillars of society like the Koch brothers and Stephen Schwartzman, he was attempting to turn MIT into an annex of Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. While that is, I believe, an unfair assessment both of Professor Reif and of campus life, there is a really palpable new resentment felt by many faculty members about the amount of money spent on helping professionals. And instead of giving students time to gain some sense of personal control, these guidelines and these offices are often used to protect students, especially women, from maturing. I mean, before this meeting started, I said that I'd like to get the statistics on how many women versus men use S cubed. I, I really don't know, but from my own classes, that's how I feel, more women than men. Women are taught to ask for help, men are resistant to it still. The stumbling and picking oneself up described by so many oral histories and commented on by the interviewer in her note as a great help to her, might not occur today. Or if it does, there are mechanisms to mitigate the effects. Anyone who knows me knows I'm a truly caring teacher, but it worries me 
that when students when, when students come to my office as they did this past fall and tell me that the movies I assigned for homework are offensive and I should add timestamps, you know what that is, right? Timestamps is when uh, you say, okay, at 12.1 minutes in the film, turn it off, timestamps so that anytime there is nudity, they can skip the frame. Or students who tell me I shouldn't teach certain books because they're too depressing. And then I'll get a call from SQ. You know, this book is really depressing and she's going through a hard time. And, or counseling deans who call with extremely lame excuses for students who've missed work because the student him or herself can't write a note. Or that a specific student should be excused from a specific reading that neither the dean nor the student has ever approached because it might be upsetting. This was particularly funny. I was te I teach one course a year in Spanish, and I was teaching a course in Spanish. And the novel, I got a call from a counseling dean who said, you know, this student can't read this because there's a rape. And I thought, God, maybe I misread it. I didn't think there was a rape in this novel. So I went back. And indeed, there was no rape in the novel. There was um, ideation by the fictional ideation by one uh, character about a possible seduction, but there was no rape. And so it turned out that the student had just misread the Spanish. Um, and the myriad choices of gender identities, which I truly think is a good thing, have created another layer of uncertainty. Students come to my office now and say, I don't know if I'm really cisgender. Or my roommate is a lesbian and it scares me because what if I am too? Or I really don't think transgender women should live in McCormick. Or I really think transgender women should live in McCormick. And yet the real mechanisms at MIT for redressing harassment of all kinds rests with an office called IDHR, which is totally dysfunctional. Another oral history interviewer, president of her sorority and a student in four of my classes, she's spectacular, just graduated, said over our farewell coffee that she was sick of the fact that sexual assault cases could not be adjudicated fairly at MIT by IDHR because she had been repeatedly told they don't have enough personnel. How to be a grown up has always been a college task, along with how to be a critical thinker. But it seems for reasons beyond my understanding that this developmental task feels like an impossible one for many young women today. Sometimes I wonder if it's the overemphasis on developing executive function, which if you've had children, you know, in our schools, we really push executive function. Um, students arrive in my office with lists, priorities, and the most elaborate color-coded calendars that include, say, a half hour for dinner. There is a sense that an unplanned future is probably not worth living. No trust that their intelligence and education will accumulate light, will, will illuminate the way of life. There's a plotting that too often has replaced passion. And of course, for women, the notion of college degree as a necessary economic credential is relatively new, and we're still accommodating to that. They've watched their parents. They know that the exodus, the exodus of women from the home to the workplace has not been accompanied by a new view of marriage and work that would make that transition smooth. Two thirds of mothers with children under two are now in the labor force. But the flexibility of workplaces varies, they know that, and it hasn't kept up with the needs of workers and families. They, and they know, for example, that childcare at MIT costs close to $3,000 a month per child from your net income. They know, at least if they've taken women's agenda studies classes, that fathers aren't doing much more at home there are so many studies they see about hours working women and men devote to housework and children that show working women average three hours a day on housework and children and men average 29 minutes. And that's a vast national study uh, of, of families where both parents work and there are children. 
In a recent study of working families in Greater Boston, it was found that working men married to working women spent only 45 minutes longer a week uh, when they had kindergarten age children than did men married to housewives. There's a huge leisure gap, they know that too. My women students know all this and it scares them. They worry about success, their parents want them to be great scientists, doctors, engineers, but also great wives and mothers. Their inner voices now tell them that they should work, be successful, autonomous, strong, but that it is often in conflict with the dynamics of relationships in which they're engaged at MIT. And many of them are miserable. I have been told that more than one third of our undergraduates are on psychotropic medication. One part of me knows that only when we can be honestly reflective and more decisive about working on the social, political, economic, and private climate in which we live, will the unfinished business of integration into, of women into the workplace that began in World War II be accomplished. But in our small institutional sphere, how can we help guide those students who, despite such great breadth of courses, feel constrained to follow the conventional, the planned, and therefore not threatening and risk-free lives that someone else has mapped out for them. If we could bottle the insight gained from students who conduct the oral history influence interviews, that missteps don't mean failure, that life cannot be mapped out in a linear way, that it's okay to be confused, it would be a first, but of course, an imaginary step. So I don't know, I leave it open to you. Maybe a bot will figure it out. That's the end of my talk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Marjorie. Wow, that was, um, <laughs> that was rather overwhelming. It, it, kind of, it kind of touched my own heart in many ways. So um, there are many comments in the chat. I'm gonna just, um, some of them are similar. So I'm gonna just, read through because Marjorie, you probably didn't have a chance to look at any of them. And mm -hmm. then um, and then we'll open it up to Q&A because the most of the things in the chat are currently are comments. Um, OK, so um, Megan Smith posted uh, a link regarding Galileo's daughter, that there is some evidence that she prepared manuscripts for some of Galileo's books. And that's when you were talking about nuns and convents and, and mm -hmm. science. Um, and then there were many comments about when the dorm started being integrated, which happened to be around actually 1970, not 1980. Um, no, 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 because uh, not 70, because when I was uh, head of house at McCormick, 1978 through 86, um, I was women in 77, 78, 79, couldn't live in Baker and McGregor. That, that uh, but East Campus and Senior House, at least, is mentioned. And one woman says she moved into Baker in 1974 in her junior year. Well, that was very unusual because I was part of the committee that had the plan to integrate Baker and McGregor. And one of the problems was the male students gave women students the worst suites. And so the committee tried, because everything was determined by seniority, and the influx of women into Baker and McGregor and Newhouse um, meant that, you know, they didn't have seniority. So we tried very hard to change that, to change the room and suite assignment. So I don't know, I didn't know that there was one person in 1974, but truly when I was head of house at McCormick, um, I, I participated in the integration of the dorms. Excuse me, it was not just one woman. There was a bunch of women who moved in to Baker House in 1974. Um, people came in. Yeah, it, it was a significant group and we didn't get the, I got one of the best rooms in the house. Okay, can I ask people to please uh, raise their hands before unmuting themselves and I'll call on you. I can't find the raise my hand for some reason, I'm sorry. Okay. Can I just uh, say that? I mean, I think that if a, if one group of women moved in, that's okay. But when the dorms became truly integrated and large waves of women moved in, the problems emerged. 
um, you know, obviously, if you moved in as one or two suites, it's quite different from saying to a group of men, now you have to give up the seniority method of choosing dorms, uh, choosing suites. That's all. all right, so I'm um, moving on. Um, uh, let's see, Kim Leslie Hunter says she remembers interviewing an applicant who desperately wanted to attend MIT, but went to Harvard because her parents and grandparents would cut her off if she came to MIT. Um, this was an early uh um 2000s so that was when you were speaking of parents cutting off students if they if they went into the wrong major um s cubed is student support services and some links have been posted in the chat if people are interested um hillary hotelling mentions that she wished she had asked for more help when she was at mit but she thought she had to figure things out on her own which i'm also class of 85 and i i feel like exactly the same way i never asked for help um but that the current infantilization makes no sense though there should be a balance um idhr has is defined as the institute discrimination and harassment response office there's also a link for that posted in the chat um there's a comment by Rosalie Bright that the suicide rate during the 1970s was very high while the administration did nothing about it. And another one more comment on um, mental health services was that uh, it looks like 15 to 20 percent of MIT students visit the uh, mental health and counseling services every year um, and that it's covered by tuition so students don't have to pay an extra charge. Um, yeah, so I think those are the comments about that. I'll, there may be more lower down. And I just say one thing, I'm all in favor of having really strong student support services, but our mental health services have changed in my lifetime dramatically. When I was head of house, there were psychiatrists in mental health services, and now that's not the case. The people in mental health services, the psychiatric social workers and psychologists, we don't have MD anymore people in that service. I think it's changed. All right. Um, let's see. You know, we do have a couple of hands raised, so I'm going to go from the chat to hand raising. So let's see. It looks like Sandy, um, please unmute yourself. Um, I just want to get this settled about the co-ed living. Co-ed living first was at Student House in 1969 as an experiment. The following year, because that was successful and that was based on a financial aid consideration because McCormick was the only dorm for women and it was by far the most expensive dorm. This, the next year, Student House, Sigma Nu, which now is, number, uh, is now E Theta, and number six club were the independent living groups uh, fraternities, there were no sororities that became co-ed. And two floors of East Campus, third and fourth East, and an entry of senior house, Cynthia, who's my class, is nodding her head. And that was why. And it was restricted because the idea was not to sprinkle, as they did in the classes at that time, one woman in each session of freshman physics. You were always by yourself. It was so that women were not isolated, and also then they would convert the bathrooms. They actually converted them. The urinals were still there, but they put other stalls in and they put showers for women. So that was purposeful. What Marjorie says is true, and that is later they decided to expand it. But again, they were it was the idea of developing a critical mass in a few dorms rather than spreading the women out. Because one of the things, and this was discussed in the ad hoc report, and I know Paula Stone is on the call and she was the co-chair of that committee that I was on, one of the things was that guys on the floor, they wanted to talk to women. So they would come and you would spend, you know, there was one of you and each of you had to give 10 minutes to them and you couldn't get any work done. I mean, it really, you know, this is written down. So that's why it was done in that way. The admissions requirement, again, it's in the ad hoc report, changed in for the people admitted in 71. I was admitted, I came into campus at 70, as did Cynthia, and I think there's one other classmate on this phone call. We were 60-something women. 
the class of 75 year after us started at over 120. There was a huge jump. That is, if you look at the graph, that is the single biggest jump ever. It was a doubling in one year. And then it was 120 for a while. And then there's other stories after that. But there are documents where you can read this. The ad hoc committee report is in the archives. Um, and institutional research has the numbers on admission and the dorms. All right, thank you, um, Sandy. Um, so can I ask then, uh, Megan Smith, you have your hand raised. Please. Hi, uh, my son is graduating from high school today. So we're in the middle of lots of crazy. Um, and uh, Margie, uh, just uh, gracias por su uh, enseño. If you want yo puedo hablar un poquitito de español. So Pero nadie, nadie nadie va a entender. <laughs> yeah. So um, just a, a couple really the cool things. Thank you for this. And I'm so happy to be with all of you guys because the more we're connected as a coalition, even though whatever we're doing might be federated in this work, the better. Um, I put a bunch of links in because with President Obama, we started something called Image of STEM. Um, I remember walking into the Oval Office and uh, President Prince William had just left. And I said, sir, what we're about to do is related to the prince. And he said, how's that? Because we were about to do some coding, make him the coder in chief. And, uh, and, uh, I said, you know, the Duchess of Cambridge, her, her great aunt and grandmother, Kate, uh, were code breakers at Bletchley Park. And he said, oh, I just saw that movie. And I said, yes, Turing. And it's uh, two thirds of the people at Bletchley were women. He's like, the movie doesn't show that. I said, yes, sir, it's killing the economy. So I think uh, we, and then he went on and we had, we had collected Grace Hopper's archive. Uh, there's nothing from medicine in a box, but everything from Grace is in a box. And so we we brought in and the kids explained who Grace Hopper, of course, he knew who Grace Hopper was, but and then he riffed perfectly to the press about the um, imbalance of how the stories are told. And so just wanted to thank you for the archives work that just is extraordinary. And for others, the the work that's going on with MIT and enslavement class, the work that's going on with indigenous um, histories and really having the students as a lab going into our archives and surfacing history and relooking and learning together is really good. And just, so I'm just sort of lifting this imagery point for you. And I have a hope that we do a coalition of the class, the work you're, you, you created with everyone for the archives, this other work that we create something, I wanna create something I would nickname it infinite roots. And that we begin through the writing program to lift um, all of the histories. I even have a wild art project for the great court where we fly drones and add the other names with the wonderful men from North Europe and. Uh, white men from Europe and, and North America who are all over the, but we could add all the others. So it'd have a big and, it's not an or. Anyway, lots of fun things to do that we could do together. And the thing that I really wanted to share most of all, I'm going to share my screen really quick because Kim gave me this, um, a photograph uh, that was just, that just happened. Um, oh dear, I can't find it. Uh, that is um, Sally, our new president, um, is together with, I, I might have to come back to it because it's not appearing on my screen for some reason. Um, Sally, our new president, uh, was just um, together with all of the leadership of MIT, and the photo is all women. So we're really making progress. We have so much more to do, you know, and, and it's all a matter of priorities. When uh, we had to rebuild the Pacific Fleet, they opened 33 daycare centers in three months. So I'll be back with a photo, but just thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, thank you, Megan. All right, I'm going to take one more raised hand, and then I'm going to go back to the chat. So Paula, Paula Stone. Uh, thank you. This was a fascinating talk. And um, there was one aspect of this that I actually found quite shocking, Marjorie. And I wonder if you could um, share your views on this. I put this in the chat too. That you said that current students want to avoid reading uncomfortable material. That's that true. you have to cue those things, that they resist those things, that they don't want to read things that are outside their sort of planned cocoon, I found absolutely shocking. I guess it's because I have a preconceived notion of who the parents are in this country. Occasionally you read that one parent has shut down a, a, an elementary school library's choices of books, I think, oh, well, it's ignorance. I mean, I attribute that to ignorance. 
But here we're talking about intelligent uh, people who are at the Institute. And, and what comes to me is I can understand that for uh, students that have indeed been traumatized yeah. and you don't want to re-traumatize them, certainly if they don't have support within the Institute to handle that. But they're already coming to the Institute having been culturally uh, and socially taught, conditioned not to go to these places, which is what life is. And so how, wh how do you counteract? What do you do to counteract these huge forces that are already shaping students before they come to MIT to avoid what the nature of life is, which is uncomfortable and unplanned. Exactly, and, and you can't because I'm in literature. And so what I do in my courses is at the beginning of the semester, I go through my syllabus and I say, this is what this is about. And if you don't wanna be here, you don't have to be here. But this course is about dealing with these issues of race, class, gender, and it's they know it beforehand and they stay, but then they're surprised that the, the, at the challenges that some of the books present. I try very hard to be nice. <laughs> it's very hard for me, I have to tell you. Um, and it, partially it's hard for me because I agree with you that growing up is about learning about these differences and fighting them and sort of understanding the conflicts. And it's both hard for me and sometimes it's hard to be sympathetic. Let me share one thing with you. Um, last semester I had a freshman, second semester freshman in a communication intensive freshman course who came to me and said, uh, I need to know my grade. This is like eight weeks into the course. I, said, I have no idea. And why do you want to know? And she said, well, because I'm going to get a PhD and I can't have a B. So I need to know if I'm tracking an A. And I said, first of all, what the grade you get in globalization, the good, the bad, the in-between isn't going to impact your PhD application. Secondly, are you working hard in this course? And she said, sort of. She said, but I can't really deal with the Chinese material. So I teach a book called Chaos and All That, which is by a Chinese author who is uh, trained as a classical pianist in Beijing, goes to London, falls in love with American jazz, starts composing, because this course is on globalization, uh, music that combines Chinese tonal music and American jazz, and writes a book about growing up during the Cultural Revolution called Chaos and All That. And she said, it's too disturbing. Well, what do you do with something like that? I mean, it, yeah, I said, it's a novel, but it's based on reality as she lived it. And it's part of this course. Well, I don't think I can read it. I started it. I can't read it. Uh, the beginning is very funny, actually. But um, what I do is I just say, this is college, you know, and sometimes I get calls from the dean's office. Um, but you know, I'm old and tenured, so that's a protective force. But I do want our students to engage in these issues because I think it's better for them to learn about them and to experience them in college than in the workplace. And I don't know, I'm, I'm asking you guys. Actually, I, I have no answers. Well, you know, it depends on what is the role of the Institute or any college, but we're talking about MIT. Or what does it mean to prepare someone for living in the world? And is it just to get the MIT degree and go out and get the fancy job and make the money, and which MIT students happen to be very good at? <laughs> or is it to learn how to interact socially with people and learn how to deal with the joys and the sorrows of life? This is the opportunity that MIT has in order to influence that. And I guess the broader question is, I mean, it's wonderful that you're alert to this within your own classes, but not everybody's taking your classes. There's <laughs> the rest of the universe. And so I'm just saying, I was shocked to hear this and just wonder what is the Institute is, does the Institute have a responsibility? And if they do, 
how what what's the way forward on this because it it this is what life is i'm it's just well, I, know, I think this is a really important issue you guys are so important because every single student i've had who has worked on the amida oral history project has gotten that perspective. Every single one of them writes, as did the one I quoted at the beginning. And in fact, when I was preparing this talk, I went back over Leon Zarsky's um, interview, which was one of the first. And I realized, wow, I haven't talked to Relin Hartke, the person, the student who did it, who's now a professor of physics. And I texted her. And I said, hey, Relin, remember me, you know, from years back? And she said, how could I forget the oral history project changed my life? Doing those interviews, because you can provide that perspective that you're right. As a teacher, you have a very limited audience. And that's why I said, if we could bottle those interviews, the experience, it would help. But there must be good ways to share your experiences with the larger public. I don't know. So thank you. All right, thanks. So there's a lot going on in the chat, and I don't think we're going to have time to read it all um, out loud. <laughs> but I suggest people scroll through it if they're interested. Um, there's one student, I'm, I'm trying to find it again, who uh, mentioned um, that she had gone to services and was told, Marjorie, as you had said, that they can't help her. Um, which is it's a very sad state of affairs. And then this one I just found by uh, Mary M said that while she was at MIT, there was an excellent dean whose name she doesn't remember who counseled her when she was being sexually harassed. And she told her to write things down and use statements such as, I feel comfortable when, dot, dot, dot. And she's used it throughout her career. And um, I, I'm, I'm the moderator, but I'd actually like to follow it up. Um, sometimes when people do or say things that you find uncomfortable in real life, you're like a deer in the headlights because you can't believe the person just said that or the person just did that. Um, and so I've learned like um, Mary M that it's good to have some catchphrases like in your head that you can just say right back to them. Like if somebody says something really sexist to you about like women, what women can or can't do or uh, value of women versus value of men, you say, did you really just say that to me? Yeah. to turn it around and put it on them rather than to put it on you <laughs> um let's see there was a lot going on about the housing um yeah i'm just looking for a different topic um oh there there okay going back to wanting to avoid uh, reading uncomfortable materials so this is from paula stone um so while um it might, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, uh, might be appropriate to force people to look at uncomfortable material for their own personal growth. But what happens to someone who has truly previously been traumatized and that it is more tricky, um, you know, for someone who maybe has, um, you know, like experienced rape to force them to read something that's uncomfortable. And how do you balance that? Are you asking me? <laughs> I, uh, if you, yes, if you would, and this is, I think this is going to be the last thing because then we need to move to the business. Meeting. Obviously, if a student comes to me or if S cube tells me, hey, this is a real situation. First of all, I, I don't teach any books that have, to my knowledge, rape in them. But um, if, if there's a really uncomfortable situation, of course, of course, one would take it seriously. It's more often a religious objection or a mis misinformation that the student has a, about a book they haven't read yet or an image. Images I find are even worse because I always, I often assign movies as homework that go with the book. And those are more problematic because students have been told by certain in certain religious groups, you shouldn't watch a certain thing. I have a problem with that because they chose MIT, right? And so what I say is, you've chosen MIT. You don't have to take my course. You can take economics to fulfill the Haas requirement, and you won't have any of these problems. But if you're taking my course, you can't study post-Franco Spain without watching Almodovar's films. It's just He's, he's just too important a cultural figure. So you decide. So I give them the, the opportunity to decide at the beginning of the term. 
Okay, and then there was just um, one more thing where there was a question on whether or not, you know, this issue of um, cultural tr uh, triggers and sensitive information, if, if that's just an MIT thing or if it's no. uh, more broad amongst universities. All universities. Yeah. So um, unfortunately, I mean, this is a great conversation, but we have to move to our business meeting. Um, there's been a request to send the photo of the women leaders. So I think that was from um, Megan Smith. If you could email that to me, then we can post it on the sure. And it's in the chat. If you happen to go there and have right. that ability, you can. Yeah, the chat's going to disappear. The chat's going to disappear as soon as I close the meeting, unfortunately. And I'm not 100% sure it gets captured in the recording. So if you could email, email it to me, uh, that's great. And we'll we'll share it if, uh, if Colleen hasn't already. And... Um, for those of you who have registered for the business meeting, there is another Zoom link. You should have received an email with that link. And um, if you haven't registered for the business meeting but are interested and you are an AMITA member, if you look in the chat, there um, are links for registering for the business meeting and you'll get the email right away with the link to, to get into the meeting. Um, again, you have to already be a member. And um, we are three minutes over. We probably could have gone on for another half hour easily. Um, so I want to thank all of you for attending this morning. Um, it's been really great to have you all here and so much participation. And I look forward to seeing um, some of you in a few minutes. Thank you very much. And also, if you'd be interested, I'd be happy in the fall to continue this conversation in a more informal way. Um, with anyone who's interested. I really would be happy to do that because I want some insight. I know that's an, 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 I'm going to have to end the meeting soon, but it's a really interesting idea. The new platform we're moving to, Hivebright, has um, the ability to do forums. So yeah, just talk to me over the summer. Maybe we can set something up. Thank you again. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Right. Thank Bye -bye. you, Marjorie. Right. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Marjorie. <laughs>